Amen. Good to have a seat, church. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 today. Hey, bu hey bud, what's up? Good, man. All right. Glad to have you here. Luke 10. Uh, we're going to be reading the parable of the Good Samaritan today. Um, let me just begin by saying, man, what a couple of, of weeks. This week particularly has been a, a peak and valley kind of week. There's been great stuff going on uh, in, in, in my life. I see God moving in the church. I see God moving the world. Uh, I get the joy of being able to celebrate, as you mentioned, our, our Riley has her birthday today right here. She's celebrating. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, our, our youth pastor, Scotty Cowan, got engaged this week to one of our own, Emily Burroughs. They're seated down there in the front row, so we celebrate that. Um, I got to geek out a little bit. I got to go meet some of my childhood baseball idols. I got my picture with Dwight Gooden and Daryl Strawberry this week. And I mean, I was like, uh, I was, I was like nine years old again. It was awesome, and uh, I was in La Jolla and, and enjoying listening to them talk and and hearing them actually talk about how uh, God had redeemed, the, you know, them from the pit of, of substance abuse and other things. And Doc Gooden's still very much a work in progress, we'll say. But Strawberry um, goes around the country and talks at great length about how God delivered him from from drug abuse and stuff like that. So I, that picked me up, and then. It's so like all of that, and then in the midst of it, right, you've got all these things, some things going on in your personal life, and, and then you, you see what's going on around the country, right? You've got, you've got, you've got Buffalo, and you've got uh, Uvalde, Texas, and you've got these other things where you're just like, I mean, quite literally, oh my God, you know, please, uh, Lord have mercy, you know. Um, so these series, I, you may or may not know, are planned out well, a long way in advance, and the Good Samaritan was planned for this week. Um, and I thought to myself, as all of that was going down, I go, you know, actually, um, it's a perfect parable for us to try and figure out, okay, exactly how are we to be neighborly in the time and place in which we live? Uh, how are we supposed to respond to things, uh, and not just those specific cases or those particular things, but, but on a daily basis? Jesus told this particular parable, and it is one of his classics. I mean, it is, one, other than the prodigal son, probably his best-known parable, and people use it as guidance and wisdom all around the world to this day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start and give you the thesis at the outset. The answer to the question that is asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor, is yes. Okay. Uh, let's go this way with it. Good news stories. You ever need one of those? You got to Google something just to make yourself feel a little better? Give me stories of, of, of people doing good things in the world. They're out there. Uh, if you don't see them around you, you should, but, but get eyes to see. Ask God for eyes to see. God, let me see the good stuff too. Uh, I got on, I started going through some of the things that people would do just to be kind to people, people they didn't necessarily know, but people they encountered in society. In one case, there was a, a dinner scene, they were eating at a guy was eating at a restaurant in Boston, and he sees a mom and a daughter in there, and he can tell they're waiting on something. He overhears them talking about waiting on a big phone call, and, and he, the, she picks up the phone, the mom does. And he can read between the lines. She's getting a diagnosis. She'd been tested. Turns out she's got cancer. Um, and so they, they're kind of sad and weeping at the table. And he decides he's going to pick up their check. Um, and, and they're just extremely, extremely grateful for that. And then when I, you know, you, there's kind of threads that you can find online. This was one. I was like, hey, I'm on the good news train here. I'm enjoying this. Let's, let's give me more. Give me more. Uh, so... Uh, here's a soldier who's helping a woman across a flooded street. Uh, here's one of a young boy on a cold morning bringing a cup of hot chocolate and a donut to a crossing guard. Here's a young teenage boy bringing blankets and pillows on a cold night to help homeless people through a chilly night. Here's a neighbor. They put a plastic cover over an open window of somebody else's car to keep the rain from soaking the interior. Man, I wish they were around for me a couple of times. A police officer stops his car, gets out to help a shivering dog who's stranded and lost. Somebody makes sandwiches and goodies, puts them in bags, sets them out for the homeless there in the city in which they live. During Superstorm Sandy, this one was one where a person who, who was one of the only people that had electricity, they ran an electric extension cord out into the neighborhood and offered to let people charge their cell phones for free uh, based on the power in her house. Then you have a teenage boy in a wheelchair being blessed with crowd surfing at a concert. The next photo is a sign at a Subway store who offers free meals to the homeless during certain hours one day a week. 
You have a dry cleaner reaching out to unemployed people to help them clean their interview clothes for free or help them look for a job. These stories are everywhere. They're out there. There's good news. These are like everyday heroes, the people that it just seems in their nature to want to bless people. Uh, they just kind of ask themselves, hey, what can I do? You know, those kind of things. And you just, you just stand around and say, you know, God, I need to hear some of those stories every now and then. Because the other ones are really tough sometimes. Uh, I remember not that long ago, um, a few years ago, I went out to get the mail, and there was an elderly lady sitting across the street, and her, she was sitting there, kind of sitting there, she was laying down on one side, and her leg was bleeding real badly. And I saw her trash can had fallen over, so I put two and two together, and I said, hey, you know, she, she was out trying to get her cans in, fell, injured herself. She was just laying there. Nobody could help her. It was Thursday afternoon. Nobody was around. They were all at work. And so I was able to go over and, and help her. But then what I thought was, you know what? I'm glad I was there. But on the other hand, I'm going, what if, what if, what if that was a dangerous thing to do? What, what, what if there were people there with guns? What if there were people there that had knives or, or they looked enormous and threatened me? Would I have done it? If I was scared. The story of Kitty Genevieve, some of you may remember this. This is one of the great tragedies. There's actually a syndrome called Genevieve syndrome or bystander syndrome. It addresses the question of why people stand by and do nothing when they see a, a, a crime taking place. Kitty Genevieve, New York Times reports, 3.20 in the morning, March 13th, 1964. She's 28 years old. She pulls up to her apartment complex. She has 35 yards to get from her car to her apartment. She gets out of the car and is assaulted by a guy Getting out, as she gets out of her car, she screams. The people in the apartment complex hear her. They open the windows and say, hey, you know, what's going on down there or whatever. So the, the assailant takes off and flees. Everybody closes their windows, turns the lights off, goes back inside. Meanwhile, she's still there on the street. So she tries to make it from where she is now, maybe 25 yards to, to the apartment complex. The guy comes back, attacks her again. She screams, the apartment lights go on, everybody, hey, what are you doing down there? Da, 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 da. He takes off, and she's still there. Nobody comes down, nobody calls the cops, as far as we know. Some people said they did, but the cops don't come. A third time, she's still there. He comes back 15 minutes later, attacks her again. And this time, finishes the job, and she dies, unfortunately. And the question then was, what were all these people doing? And why didn't anybody go down and help this lady? right? And the answer is, they were scared. If we're being generous, that's what happened with the Good Samaritan. Well, not with the Good Samaritan, it was the other two that had the problem. Good, godly men, as far as we know. A priest and a Levite, that's two kinds of priests, by the way. The Levites, kind of the worker bees of the priestly guild, the, the, the primary priest is probably Aaronic, so he's uh, not ironic, ironic, like as from, you know, descendant of Aaron. Um, and we sit there and we, we look at them and we, it's easy to blame them. But when you read the story carefully, what you realize is if I were put in the same situation, because I am actually with some regularity, in an uncomfortable situation, one that might cost me something, then it makes it extremely difficult for me to get involved the way that these two guys don't in the way that the Good Samaritan does. Jesus is standing there and a lawyer, an attorney of that time gets up and says, so I want to inherit eternal life. How do I do that? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, okay. He, he seems to let commandment one go. He seems okay with that, but it's commandment two. He wants to figure out, okay, well, let's talk about neighborliness then. Um, who is my neighbor, he says. I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. Who is, who, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells this story in response. Here's what he says. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him. So this isn't one of these deals where they don't want to be inconvenienced. It sounds like what you would do. All right, you cross to the other side of the road. I'm in danger. I'm going over there. 
When he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him. A temple assistant, that's a Levite in most translations, walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan, that's the only kind there was in ancient Israel, came along and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, which by the way is a lot of money back then. Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. All right. Let's go ahead and unpack the text and then we'll get to the nuggets, okay? Okay. Uh, let's examine the story that Jesus tells during our time remaining. A certain man goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. Okay, so you've got here a distance of about 17 miles. Uh, if you go to uh, Israel with us next year, you'll get to see what this journey is like, what the turf is like. It's straight down, 4,000 miles of elevation change over about 17 miles. Uh, there are rock skags, and it gets very narrow in certain parts. It was a great place if you want to hide out and rob somebody to hang out. So there's ancient literature outside the Bible from the 400s AD that also talk about how dangerous this particular road is and how frequently people would rob people on this road. So this is a well-known robber's road, okay? So you've got a guy, he's, he's going down there, and it says he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He falls among the robbers who strip him, beat him, leaving him half dead. So... They don't just take his wallet. They take his clothes. They leave him half naked and half dead, sitting on the side of the road. It's a terrible situation. It almost echoes Kitty Genovese's story. But happening upon the scene are three people. Two are very similar, one's very different. First two approach, a priest and a Levite. They both had important roles in the Jewish faith. Both of them would have been trained as scholars of a sort in the Bible. They knew what they were supposed to do. It talks at great length about what you're supposed to do if you encounter somebody who's hurt or injured or is in need of, of help. They would have known, but they don't stop to help. They don't provide food. A priest, for instance, would know the Old Testament law well enough. He would know that Leviticus 19.34 says, if you see a stranger in need, you do whatever it takes to meet his need. That he would know that Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5 says, if you find your enemy's donkey in a ditch, you make sure that you rescue the man's donkey, let alone the man. They would know Psalm 37, 21, that the righteous are gracious and they give. A priest would know these things. They would know what Micah said about doing justly and walking humbly with God. They would know these things, and yet they're afraid, it seems. Not disinterested, afraid, or even worse. Here's another thing that's possible. They go over to the Samaritan. They see it's a Samaritan. That's why they move on. Now, I don't know which of these you prefer. I don't know which one's actually the case. It's a parable. It's not a nonfiction story. It's a, it's a story that Jesus tells to illustrate a particular point about what it means to be a neighbor and who our neighbors are, okay? At the very surface, basic level, that's there. But for one reason or the other, either because they were afraid or because they despised Samaritans so much that they didn't want to bother with it or risk themselves because it was a Samaritan, Meaning, yeah, God means to be merciful to people that are good Jewish people. But the Samaritans, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're mongrels. I mean, they're not, I mean, look, the, 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 the chaos between the Israelites and the Samaritans were absolutely, I mean, it was, it was awful. They, I mean, these, they despised each other. And when people say that, I mean, you need to understand, this is way beyond like, uh, oh, uh, you know, the, the talking heads on MSNBC and Fox News despise each other. This is way, way past this. This is racial. It's ethnic. It goes back centuries. Uh, it's been war, like physical war before. There have been different times uh, where this has happened. Now, again, you may remember from NBU that there's a point in time in which Israel at one point is all one, and then there's a split. During the time of Rehoboam, the kingdom splits north and south. You've got Israel in the north, Judah in the south, all right? The people that are left behind in Israel, eventually there's, a, there's a, a point in time when northern Israel is taken captive and some of the Jews are left behind. Those Jews then intermarry with the captors 
And those are who we know as the Samaritans in Scripture. And because they intermarried with the captors and they, they mixed religions and stuff like that, they are viewed by, by the Israelites at that time as kind of a half-breed kind of person, people who married the captors. And so there is a great deal of tension between these two sides. It's so strong, in fact, that during the time of Nehemiah, after the temple's been destroyed and they're trying to rebuild, they come to Nehemiah, the Samaritans do, and they say, hey, look, can we let bygones be bygones and, and we're ready to kind of get back to get, get the band back together again. We want to, um, uh, you know, we want to kind of get back in touch with our, with our Jewishness. And the Jews basically say, no, we're good. We don't need your help. So they send them away and then the Samaritans become their enemy afresh and lead the resistance to what Nehemiah is trying to do in rebuilding the wall. All right, so this continues continues to escalate. In 128 BC, the Jews go and they uh, destroy the uh, Samaritan temple that had been built on Mount Gerizim. They, they demolish it to the ground and people die in that war. So there's real war, real tension, real problems, okay? The animosity between them was profound. So whenever a Jew traveled from north to south or south to north, the easy way would be to go right through Samaria. But most Jews would go around Samaria because they didn't want to go through there. So that's why, for instance, in John uh, chapter 4, when the Samaritan woman at the well story is told, it says that little disclaimer at the beginning, and they had to go through Samaria. It's a part they did not want to go through. They didn't like the people there. They didn't like the history there. They didn't think they were one of us. They, they did, there was a lot of tension there. So notice what the Samaritan does, though. He sees a guy in the ditch who, based on how the story is told, seems to be Jewish. So he doesn't look down and see a Jew sitting in the ditch and go, oh, well, all right, good luck, dude. That's not, that's not how he handles it. Nor does he go the basic level. He doesn't pick up his cell phone, if they had him in those days, and say, hey, 911, somebody's hurt in the ditch over there, can you go help him? He didn't go to the next town and send somebody and say, hey, you know what, hey, there's a guy hurt over there about 10 miles back. You should probably go check on him. Somebody should probably go check on him. It looked like he got beat up pretty bad. Got it. It's not what he does. This guy rolls out the red carpet. He takes his own olive oil, his own wine. He gets into the ditch with this guy, binds his wounds, takes him on his own horse to the next town. The amount of money that he pays to the innkeeper gives him about depending on where you are. I mean, I don't know if this was like the Hilton or the Motel 6 of its day, but you would have had about two months worth of rent paid for the guy. And he says in the story, if it costs you anything else, I'm good for it. Next time I come through here, uh, I'll make it up to you. But take care of this guy. So why did he do it? Passage says when he saw him, he had compassion compassion. All right. So that's everything we just told about. That's the content of the story, the context of the story. The setup is, how do I inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, who is my neighbor? Good Samaritan story is told, go thou and do likewise, as it says in the King James. All right. Uh, there's some missing pieces here, and I, I want us to kind of go behind the text and see why they're missing and put them back in place. Here we go. Uh, the more we love God, the more we love our neighbor in general. There's a connection always between loving your neighbor and loving God. The more that your heart becomes like that of Jesus, the more you are equipped to and more likely to actually love your neighbor. So the, under, the, the way that we look at this a lot of times, and especially I think in the day and age in which we, we live, in which uh, people assume that if a person is focusing on their character and their spiritual development or they're, they're praying you know, when a tragedy happens, that that's a waste of time in some ways, or it's a way of getting out of the action. No, that's not really at all how the Bible sees these things. Um, in fact, I'll go as far as to simply say, if you ever hear a Christian particularly doing anything to mock or put down prayer, uh, run from them. <laughs> because that is a, a, an unbiblical idea to the core. From cover to cover in the Bible, prayer is actually viewed as the starting point for everything, your, your, your everyday life and in times of crisis. So that doesn't mean that 
uh, that exempts you from action, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but boy, you start acting without, without uh, the, the foundation of faith and the foundation of the heart of Jesus in you, and what you end up doing is malpractice in good works. You end up messing around with things that make things worse rather than better. So um, I'll use the illustration of soccer here. Uh, you didn't know I was a big soccer guy, and I wasn't. About two years ago, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to try to like soccer. I'm just jumping in. Here we go. Picked a team, and I've, I started to love it, actually. It's kind of contagious once you decide I'm going to like this. Penalty kicks at the end. Let's say you're a world-class soccer player. You're in the World Cup, end of the game, penalty kick on the line. It's your kick, and if you make this kick, you guys win the World Cup. You will be a legend for life. You will never uh, pay for your own meals in a restaurant again. Uh, you will never pay for a drink again in your life. Uh, you will never want for anything because you will be a celebrity. And so ready, you are. You look at the goal, and there's the goalie standing in front of you. Now, the statistical analysis of the goal in a penalty kick situation is interesting. 75% of penalty kicks are good at the elite level. That's pretty good. So you figure, all right, I'm going into this. I got a 75% chance of making this. So then you kind of go, okay, well, what should I do? Well, the speed of travel of the ball in most elite soccer games is about 80 miles an hour. That's fast, by the way. If you don't know how fast that is, um, it's fast. Uh, it's kind of, you're going to want to not, you know, stop the ball with your face kind of a speed. And um, because of the distance is not that far, you are going to need to kind of guess. You can't really just see where it's going and, and dive for it. You have to kind of guess where you think it's going to go. So... The highest likelihood kick is if you can actually spot it way up in the far corner of one side or the other of the goal. But, I mean, it's got to be a flawless kick. You can't, you can't be off an inch or two or he'll get it. But if you can perfectly place it, that's the highest chance kick. The problem is your chances of kicking the ball that way are not very good. So that kick actually is not. Because while hypothetically that would be the highest, it's not. Because you can't make the kick. So you decide you're going to ease up a bit, aim a little bit away from the corner then. Uh, and so that gives him or her, whoever the goalie is, a, a better chance. Now, they have to guess. 57% of the time, they guess the strong side of the kicker. So if it was me, this side. So 57% of the time, they're going to jump that way. Okay? 41% of the time, they're going to jump the other way. 57 plus 41 is what? 98. Good. The first service was uh, not as good at math as you guys are. Um, 98. So there's 2% left. Well, what does the goalie do in the other 2%? They stay put right in the middle. They don't move at all. Now, the highest percentage of success kick, by the way, 17% more likely, than, or I'm sorry, 7% more likely to be successful than the others is a kick right at the goalie. The highest percentage. But the goalie only does that in 2% of the cases. And the kicker only kicks it straight at the goalie in about 17% of cases. So I'm sitting here and I'm going, all right, so wait a minute. You're telling me that the highest percentage, my best chance to win the World Cup for my country is to just kick the ball straight. Well, okay, and the goalie knows that. So, but I don't kick it straight, and he doesn't stay straight. Why aren't we doing it? Because of shame. I mean, can you imagine? World Cup on the line. I just kick the ball right at the goalie. Goalie doesn't move. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> World Cup over. You lose, all right? I mean, you'd feel so stupid that you're just like, okay, I got to go for something different because if that happens, I mean, we're, we're all, or imagine being a goalie. And you decide that, Okay, I'm going to stand right here, and the guy kicks it to the corner, and you're just like, ooh. And up it goes, a goal in the corner, right? Well, now it's like, okay, now I feel stupid. Well, both people are afraid of feeling stupid, so neither one of them do it. And so the kickers kick that way, and the goalie jumps some way, and nobody stays in the middle for the most part, even though that's your highest chance of success as a kicker. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that prayer is starting to become the penalty kick of the Christian faith. Uh, it is becoming something that 
almost seems too simple to be effective. And it doesn't matter what you say about, I mean, I read cover to cover about the, uh, from the Bible, um, how when the Israelites, by the way, you know, when God decides he's going to free the Israelites, what it is that makes them do it, it's their prayers. When God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, what is it that drives God to take action? It's the cries of the people. And I could walk you through all sorts of, of um, biblical examples of, of how Jesus addresses prayer and, and Scripture encourages us to pray. And I could go on and on and on. In fact, this week, James is in the news, man. Everybody loves James. And they should. James is incredible. And, and so, you know, we get, hey, faith without works is dead, Christians. Amen. Very good. Totally agree. Uh, and you get what, you know, what good is it if you look at your brother and he's starving and he needs food? And you just tell him, hey, be warm and filled. What good is that? Yeah, what good is that? So people then have been using that this week to say, therefore, go do something and essentially don't pray. Or uh, don't, don't give us thoughts and prayers. Go do something, right? As though they're dichotomous. They're not. They're not. Because if you read James and you went outside those proof texts, James has three big themes. One, faith and works and how they go together. The dominant theme, if you ask most biblical scholars, is prayer. Is any one of you in trouble? They should pray. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. That comes from James. Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And for three years it didn't rain. He prayed again and then it started to rain again. So captain action is also captain prayer. <laughs> right? And you know what his third one is? The tongue. What we say. Man, uh, you know, uh, this week, one of the, if you guys ever see me being really quiet on some of these things, it's because I know I should not speak right now. <laughs> and James in the, in, the, in the text says, man, it's like a, a horse being led around. It's like a bit in a horse's mouth, and it, and it pulls you around. It just takes you places that you don't even think. It's like a fire, he says. It's like, it's like poison. It's, you know, and, and with the same tongue, we bless and curse people. And then here's my favorite. One that I find rebuking me on a regular basis. Everyone, he says. Who's that? Everyone. Should be. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, he says. These days, we're getting very slow to listen, very quick to speak, and boy, the faster you can get angry, the more virtuous you are. And God says, no, you're a fool with what you are. So before you act, before you act, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Now, now. Don't look at your brother who's over here starving in the corner and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to pray for you, buddy. Just be warm and filled. God bless you. No, no, no. But now what I do is I don't go do things to this guy that's actually going to harm him. I, I don't make stupid, unwise decisions because my heart is actually just full of rage at my life or your life or the way things are. And so scripture does, I say, tremendous favor. I mean, think about this. Uh, you know, Jesus, who is the role model, the exemplar of the Christian life, is going around, he's healing people all the time. You know, he's, he's uh, I mean, the, helping the lame walk, the blind to see, setting the prisoners free, doing all of these things. And yet, when it's in his darkest hour, what does he do? He prays. He goes to the garden, and throughout his life, by the way, there's a rhythm of prayer in Jesus' life. He goes to the garden by himself, and he asks his friends, hey guys, would you stay with me? And would you help pray with me through the night? He doesn't say, hey guys, let's form a militia and battle Rome. Or, or anything like that. He says, no, I need you here with me. Because I need the strength to do what I'm supposed to do. And I need God's power to do that. And if we want to be virtuous people as we go about doing the, the uh, godly things in the world, we need to be uh, people of faith and prayer. Before we hit the road, if that makes sense. So, 
because, point two, who you are before is who you are during. The text says he had compassion on him. My question is, why did the other two guys not have compassion on him? They should have. That's right there in the, uh, you know, the good old uh, priest 101 classes. Have compassion on people. Okay, why, why did they not seem to have compassion on him, but the Samaritan did? Both, they all three faced the same scenario. They all faced three, uh, three faced the same test, but only one of them got it right. He had compassion on him, it says. Okay, well, why was he compassionate and them not? Well, my guess is he was compassionate. He was a person of compassion before he got there. Typically, sisters and brothers, in times of tragedy, need, or grief, you become more of who you already are, not less. If you're self-interested before you see the person on the road in the ditch, you'll be more self-interested in a time of chaos. If you're anxious before you get there, you will be more anxious in a time of chaos. If you're blind to the needs of others, you become more so in times of chaos. If you're vicious with your speech before you hit the road, boy, just wait till you get there and see what comes out of your mouth when you're under pressure or angry or sad. And that's why, sisters and brothers, I mean, I know, I know that I can sound like a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal, saying the same thing over and over and over again. But man, it starts not with the hands. It starts with the heart. It just does. That's why Jesus says to him, what, what do you need to do to inherit eternal life? Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. The problem with the lawyer who's asking the question in the story is that he seems to have no problem with the first and quarrel with the second. Okay? They go together. But there is an order to them. Loving God is always number one. And a person who is preparing them in the centerpiece of their life is the preparation of their heart and their character for life on the road. They are going to be a much better, they're much more likely to be a good Samaritan on the road than a priest or a Levite. They are much more likely to stop. They are much more likely to take action, righteous action, because the heart of God is in them, and that part of them that says, that can't stand, that's wrong, we need to do something, is the God in them speaking out as opposed to the worldly angry person speaking out. And so you can see the fruit born in the solutions. You can see it in the speech. I mean, think about it this way. Pick up time at school. If you're a parent, you have kids that you drive to school, you will pick them up hundreds if not thousands of times by the time they graduate high school. Same kid, same school, same time of day. And yet, if you were to interview my children and say, hey, is your dad the same guy every time he comes to pick you up from school? There we go. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, same dad. Same kid, same school, same time, same place. What's the difference? Me. The state of my heart when I get there, right? So, so they might get a preoccupied dad today. They might get disinterested dad today. They might get the joker today. Like I'll be laughing, messing around, doing all that stuff. They might get the prankster today. Uh, they might get dad the tardy guy today. And they might get dad the early guy the next day. They might get whatever. But, but who I am when I get there is going to determine much more so how it goes and who I am toward my kids than what anything that they do, right? So if you get a kid who comes in, say it's seventh grade, uh, I've got one of those, I've had two of them before her, they get in and they're just full of mouth today and they want to be sarcastic and be a punk or whatever, right? My ability to handle that and how I handle that is going to be shaped by who I was when it started. That's what I'm saying. Is that we always go, okay, well, I want to be, you know, let's all be good Samaritans. It's like, no, 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 you got to go back to before he hit the road. Before he hit the road. And so, I mean, I could sit there and go, well, hey, I took action. They got right home, didn't they? Regardless of what I did. But some days, I, did a good, I was a good father and picked them up in the right way and delivered them home. And other days, you know, you're 20 minutes late. You come in. You're already on the phone. It's like, hey, quiet, quiet down. I'm on a phone call, you know, in the car and da-da-da-da and get them home. And it's like, yeah, technically, I did get them home. So I can pat myself on the back and say, hey, look, I took action. But isn't it better? I mean, I, I learned at some point, 
It's actually good for me to have a commute. Doesn't need to be of an hour. That would make me mad all the time. But if it's 15 minutes, end the day, get myself together, pray a bit, get home. So that when I go through the door, I'm not wound up tightly. I'm not whatever, right? So I'm, I'm using that as an illustration to talk about the way that we all go through our lives. The Samaritan seems to have compassion for the man because he's a compassionate man. It's who he is. So the story is clearly meant to surprise the listener because he's a Samaritan helping a Jew in the ditch. But the race of the religion of the guy in the ditch doesn't seem to matter to him. It seems irrelevant. Because loving our neighbor is a universal command and a bedrock pillar of our faith. And in order to do that faithfully, You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to have full control of your heart and life so that when you do things, the fruit of the Spirit is being borne out in those times and those places. Lastly, we're always on the road. You aren't going to be on a camel. You will be in a Hyundai or a Kia or something else. But everywhere you go, you're on the road. And there are injured people everywhere you go. This afternoon, go to a restaurant, if you're inclined to do so, and when you're sitting there, look around. People sitting around you, in fact, look around the room right now. People sitting around you, there are some, they don't look like they're in the ditch, but they are. They're beat up, bruised, battered, scared, broken, hurting. If you look across and you see the gal that's on her sixth margarita, it's 11.30 in the morning. Sixth, seventh margarita, and you can just tell this gal's in pain. You look across, there's a couple. They're only drinking water, they're eating the chips, and they ordered an appetizer between them. That's it. You're like, they're broke. <laughs> you know, there, there are different places that you can look and you can see the brokenness around you if you have eyes to see. I mean, they're not all just going to be laying in a ditch from a physical standpoint, but they, there's all sorts of versions of that. And the best way I've found, if I'm on the road all the time, is to try to be a good Samaritan to everybody I encounter. Because I'm not that good of a judge that I can handpick every one of those people. But the question to who is my neighbor is yes. That's the answer. Um, it's, it's somewhat as easy as asking ourselves who needs my help than asking God for wisdom on how to act. Um, Random acts of kindness. Uh, I'd love if they weren't random. If they were constant and intentional. And I think the church can lead the way in that. I, I, I remember years ago, I think I've told you guys this story before, but if not, I'm old and I can't remember what I've said half the time now. But um, I remember uh, years ago, a friend of mine was in a, in a, in a uh, restaurant in downtown Indianapolis. He was at a Buca de Beppo, pastor friend. And he's sitting there looks across and he sees a young couple that he actually knows. And they seem a little bit off from their normal countenance. They seem a little sadder. They're starting to maybe bicker here and there. You can see the tension in the faces. Y'all have been at restaurants like that where you're looking across, you're like, ooh, about to heat up over there. You know, you're thinking you can just see people starting to get tense. He kind of senses that. He knows these people and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick up their tab. Turned out to be great. It was, it was a, a young couple at the time. They were just getting started at starting a church. They, were, they had no money they, at the time. They were broke. Uh, things were tense. Um, things weren't off to a great start in the way that they thought it would be. And, and, and so uh, they were starting to kind of do it. And they probably shouldn't have even been in the restaurant at the time because they, they were they tied on money. And it was one of those deals where it's like, let's force out something uh, to make us feel happier than we are kind of a thing. It was one of those kind of dinners. So he buys the check for them. And the wife and the couple begins to cry, and the couple is so touched that they make the decision to stay with what they're doing, starting that church instead of quitting, in part because of the little boost they got at that moment right there. And you're sitting in the church that they kept planning today. So you don't know who's broken. You don't know who's um, lying in the ditch emotionally, spiritually. 
right? And you don't know how that small little thing, the note you drop at just the right time, you know, the, and, and how often the prayers of the people of God have buoyed you without you even knowing it. You know, that somebody was praying for you, or somebody was, cared enough, somebody said the right thing to your kid in the lobby. You never knew they said it, but your kid was getting ready to totally just go bananas on you. And because they said that, the kid chilled out at a key moment in their life, and the rest is history. But that's the beauty of the way that the kingdom of God works. It's like a mustard seed. At first, it's the most unimpressive thing you've ever seen in your life, but when it's full grown, whoa. So this morning, I want us to pray to God for the vision to see people in need and a heart that is not scared or preoccupied or something that turns all of these people that are in need into Mr. and Mrs. Cellophane that, that make them invisible to us, but actually to ask God. I mean, if we ask God for that, for the vision to see these people, you're going to see them. You're going to see them. Sometimes on staff, we'll pray, God, send us people who don't know Jesus. We will introduce them to Jesus. And you know what? He does it. If you ask God to send you people that are needing help, that are broken and in pain, he will do it. And we are not going to run out of a supply of those in this country. Okay? (laughs) It's everywhere. And so at this point in time, maybe us Christians mm, can, can continue to be and continue to grow into greater Samaritan. So with that in mind, we're going to gather around the Lord's table today. We take communion every week here at New Vintage. Uh, We do this in remembrance of Jesus, who asked the question, rhetorically speaking, whose neighbor are you, in response to the lawyer who asked him, who is my neighbor? So raise your hand if you didn't get the elements and you'd like some, we will bring them to you. Um, So I'll pray and uh, Riley will lead, lead us in some music and let's remember Christ right now who told this amazing story. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this amazing story that we call the Good Samaritan Father really tells us about a good God who has the power to shape people into the likeness of his son who went about doing good and doing good for all the right reasons, doing good in the right ways. He had control of his tongue He prayed righteously. He didn't fail to act because he was preoccupied or busy or tired. So, Father, we want to be like him. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be people who don't pass by because we're afraid or pass by because we don't like the broken person that is there because we've got something against who they are, what they represent. Father, we want to be righteous in all of our ways and how we treat people. And so, Father, today we say... That the answer to who our neighbor is, is yes. We pray this in Christ's name.